Good morning, friends, and welcome to Dulcimer Crossing's Wednesday live stream. I am coming to you from my studio here in in Idaho, and I we talked about jamming last week, and one of the things I wanted to talk about today that relates to that, we were looking at how do we re read guitar chords, and it just put me in the mind of remembering that sometimes we don't know where our instruments are comparing to other instruments. And so we're going to do comparing of several acoustic instruments. And these are the kind that are going to show up when we are jamming with friends. And uh, they may be ones that we already learn. And uh, let's see here. I just want to make sure this is going so I can respond to your comments or questions. There we go. Okay. So now I'll do this, turn off my sound, and we are, whoops, ready to go. So what I'm going to do is start, let's take you away, and you are set for that. So let's start, I had the guitar here before. And so let's pick up from guitar. It's very familiar with, with a lot of people. It may or may not be an instrument that you've played or have tried to play. <clears throat> but this low E is the E that's below the bass clef on a guitar. It shows up on music as the E that's below the treble clef. But that's a convention that was developed years ago that the music on a guitar would look an octave higher than it physically sounds. So this is the E below the bass clef. This is the A that's the lowest space on the bass clef. This is the D that's the middle line on the bass clef. The G is the top space on the bass clef. The B is the one that sits right above the bass clef and is one note below middle C. And the E is the one that's just above the middle C. So it would be the lowest line on the treble clef. Or if you're looking at things from the bass clef, it's going to be one that's two. It's the second line above where the C is. That's the physical pitches of what's on a guitar. Now, an instrument that's very much like the guitar is the ukulele. And here is a baritone ukulele, and I have these here together because ukulele has four strings. The baritone does not have the my dog have fleas, bum, 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 bum. It doesn't do that, but has the same pitch names as the highest four strings on the guitar. And, and high has to do with pitch. It does not have to do with location compared to the floor. So the baritone ukulele is D, G, B, E. Its music, like the guitar, looks an octave higher than it sounds. But it is on the bass clef, except for the highest string. Now, maybe you don't play the baritone ukulele, but you know the soprano ukulele. This has four strings. This has four strings. That's a lot higher, right? A lot shorter. That's the reason why. But there's a special relationship between these two. So if I put my capo at the fifth fret of my baritone ukulele, this matches that. So the, the soprano or the standard ukulele is the same pitches, pitch names as the baritone at the fifth fret. The difference is this is called a reentrant tuning where you have a high note first, but the name of the note is still D. Actually, it's not a D because we've got the capo here. So this is... Um, A, E, C, G, A. 
G C E A. That's what it is. G C E A. G C A. So those relate to each other in the same way. And that's how they compare with the guitar. Um, this one, because we're up where we are, the C that's here is the middle C that you'd find on a piano. Well, let me move the ukuleles out of our way. And let's compare with another instrument that's got a re-entrant tuning, which means it's got a string that's high before you get to the low string. Now, this is a banjo that's tuned to an open G tuning. It's got five strings, four here, one here. The short one is higher than the others. This is not the only tuning, just like a mountain dulcimer. It's not the only tuning that we use on... on uh, in playing, but this is a G, which is the same if I would fret my my guitar G at the at my high E, I mean, at the high the high E string at the third fret, that pitch is the same as the high G on a banjo. And then it goes down and gets a D, which is the same as the D string on a guitar and a G, which is the same as the G string on a guitar, and a B, which is the same as the B string on a guitar, which is why we heard this song. And there was a dueling banjos. It was originally a tune called Feuding Banjos, um, but the dueling banjo was a banjo and a guitar duet. Ronnie Cox was playing the guitar uh, for the movie, and... Uh, they they really work together. They have they're in the same sonic space in terms of pitch, but the timbre of a banjo is different than the timbre of a guitar. So they work well together, even though they're in the same place. Some, similar to people in a chorus or a choir, that you have a flute voice and a reed voice next to each other, a round or a thin voice, and together they they carve out some sonic space for each other. Um, now, let's move to the dulcimer world. We've talked about these other instruments. How does the dulcimer compare? And so let me get my, this is my standard. But where, where oh, I've got this one in a weird tuning. Because I had a student who was talking to me about that. So this D, D-A-D. We're used to seeing D-A-D on table edit music. This looks like it's the D that's at the bottom of the treble clef. That's not where it actually sounds. So let's do a side-by-side -side comparison with the guitar. The low D on the mountain dulcimer is the same as the, the D string on the guitar. They're the same pitch. Now, the other strings, when we're tuned D, A, D, don't match any of the other strings on the guitar, but we have the same common string right there. So the D on the mountain dulcimer is in the middle range of the hammer dulcimer, I mean, the, uh, the, the guitar. And that note is, oh, we didn't get to that instrument yet. We still have to do that. We'll come back and do that one, okay? Hang on. This is... Mountain Dulcimer DAD. This D is just a little bit, it's one step lower than the high E on the guitar. So when I put my finger here, we're coming to it. Jim, Jim, hang on there. This E here is the same as the high E string of a guitar. So that's where the range is. Now, of course, in the old days, people would who into the hole, la, 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 and they would, they would uh, tune their bass string to wherever that string, that pitch was. Now, this one wants to be la, 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 la.
really wants to be. It wants to be around in the E flat kind of area, but it'll it'll work really fine here. So a standard one five eight tuning. I'm calling the steps of the scale one five eight eight being the octave of the one puts us in that range on a standard mountain dulcimer. Now, how does that, we're going to come to other mountain dulcimers in a minute, but how do all of these things compare to the hammered dulcimer? Mine has got a big extended range. This is a Dusty Strings D650, um, which means I have low notes that I have on, I haven't played on any instrument yet. But this C on the bass bridge, which needs a little retuning, it sounds like, from yesterday, that is middle C. So when we are comparing to other instruments, that's the middle C that we were comparing to. But the D that's on the bass, the bottom of the mountain dulcimer, is right here. And that's where many hammer dulcimers, that's their lowest string is this one right here. There are some smaller hammer dulcimers that stop at G, which would be the same as the G on the guitar. The uh, G string on the guitar, it would be the same as the G string that's tuned open on a banjo. It would be the same as the third fret on a mountain dulcimer, the bass string. So the mountain and the hammer dulcimer really share a lot of the same range. The middle C here would be like the sixth fret on the bass string of the mountain dulcimer. Now, this D that I have down here, if I was to play the notes that the um, guitar is actually playing, I've got an E. I, down here, I've got an A, a D, G, B. Those are the physical pitches on the guitar. So if I have a smaller hammer dulcimer, which ends at a D right here, my guitar has a couple of lower notes. And when I'm putting things together between the guitar and the hammer dulcimer, the guitar is going to, going to be the one who can physically play the pitches that are lower than what I have. On this instrument, I can play the lower pitches. Now, I also go up higher. That E way up there is, so I'd have this E, which is my E string. I've got an octave E. I've got another octave up there. I'd have to really keep on going high on my guitar strings to match that. Now, because this instrument has lower pitches, I can walk down from my D, C sharp, B, A. And then I can go further, A. I've got a B flat, an F, a G. So A, G. And now I've retuned this one to F natural. E. And then a C natural, an A. So if this is the E that's below the bass clef on the guitar over here, and I'm going even lower, that's the line that's below bass clef. This is the next space below that one. This is the next line below that one. This is the next space below that one. And this is the A. On a piano, that would be called A2. Each one of the octaves, according to the piano, is how we determine where things are. Because the first note on the lowest part of a typical piano is an A1. The Bosendorfer pianos, which have a reverse set of keys, has another octave below that. But we're not going to worry about that right now. We're going to just talk about A2, which means the next day that shows up is an A1 and A3. Let's see, we have A, A2, A1, A, A2, A3, A4, which is why C, middle C is called C4, because A is wherever all the numbering starts on the piano. So C4, C5, C6, that's a way to compare. So this instrument has a very broad range, which is one of the reasons it works very well with a fiddle. And now we're going to come to the instrument that is tuned exactly the same as a fiddle, a mandolin, open fifth tuned. 
and my lowest G here, G, D, A, E, is tuned exactly the same as the fiddle. The difference here is that I've got doubled strings in two string courses. So this G, how does it compare to the other instruments? It's the same pitch as the G string on the guitar. And then the A, or the D that's above that, is like playing the third fret on the B string of a guitar. The A is the A above that. And this E is an octave higher than the E string on the guitar. So it gets stretched out. Let's, let's do this. Um, where's my A? There it is. So the range compared to the guitar is what puts this one above that and gives it the, the space above that, much more soprano-y. Um, and that's part of why the bluegrass ensembles work, because everybody's carving out their own space. Um, oh, comparing to the double bass, the, the, the notes on the guitar, the double bass is playing notes an octave lower than that. Its notes are the same as the bottom four strings on a guitar, but an octave lower. So that puts those instruments together. But the question was raised, what about a baritone? And uh, Doug, Doug, you're saying your hammer dulcimer is a 1211. Is your, your lowest note is a G, correct? Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that about bells, that they would use a different uh, terminology. Yeah, same, same sounding kind of thing, right? Um, here's a question that was asked earlier. How does a standard mountain dulcimer compare to a baritone mountain dulcimer? And uh, this is where the ensemble question shows up. For a long time, standards, standards are just what they are. Um, and people would tune them to play as they wanted to. But now let me put these guys next to each other. We have a whole course on dulcimer crossing, which does this comparison. Aaron May Lewis and I talk about that. Um, and there is a baritone lab here on Facebook that the DJ Hamoris hosts where there's a lot of talk about this too. The typical tuning, the way these are usually built, I've got mine tuned to G right now. <laughs> That's not typically what they are. They're typically A. So let me... I have a student who plays hers in G. So the the A string on the the A E A the one five eight tuning is the same same pitch as the middle string of a standard instrument. The E here is the same as E on the bass string at the first fret. And then the A, that's the lowest string on a baritone, is an octave below this. And this is going to get to where Jim is asking about um, viola and, and those instruments. So hang on, because if I put my bass next to my baritone... Um, now I've got four strings on my bass, so I tune it in an unusual tuning, but... My A that's on the on the lowest on my baritone is the what would be the equivalent of the middle A on my bass. And my bass D, so this is a D A D, I've tuned it D A C natural D, so I can get some extra notes on this one string, but D A D, this is an octave lower. Than my standard, but it, it's like if I built a standard, a baritone, and a bass all together, I could have all the strings on there. And that's what um, Richard Ash at Fullcraft has done with the Max Dad. 
it's put, it's like putting two of these together. And if you play the middle, it's you're similar. So let me do the octaves. So now this has a note that's lower than my guitar, because if I want to make my low E of the guitar match, I play my first fret on the mountain, the bass mountain dulcimer. That's the E. But if I lower it to the open D, it's like retuning my guitar to drop D tune. So, whoops, we can put you over here. There's a stand for you. We also have some bass lessons on, on dulcimer crossing as well with Elaine Conger teaching that. Um, let's do, let's answer this question. In the string orchestra, this is a vi you know, violin and fiddle, same instrument. Some people say the same hardware, different software. If you're playing a violin, you're playing the same pitches as this. If you play a viola, your highest string is the same A as a violin, and you've got a D and a G, and then you've got a C below that. And that's the four strings of the viola. If you play a cello, you have the same strings as a viola, but an octave lower. And if you play the double bass, it's the same pitches as the electric bass, which is an octave lower than what's on the guitar. So you've got this whole um, uh, spectrum of sounds. Now, if there are people who build what's called a mandola, which is like a mandolin for double string courses, but it's tuned like a viola. So you'd have the mandolin that's like the violin. You've got the viola and the mandola. And then there are people who build mando cellos, which also have doubled strings, but they're all the same pitches as what a cello would be. And there's bass mandolins as well. And in the 20s, there were um, there were banjo and mandolin orchestras that were very popular. People like to play music together. We're in this period of time, and people like to play dulcimers together. <laughs> a five string fiddle yes there are a lot of there are there are people who build guitars with seven strings so they can get a low b a uh, dan crary is in a marvelous flat picker and i remember being at winfield listening to him play he said oh, i just got this new guitar and he starts going digga, 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 digga. and i popped up i was laying back on my on my back just enjoying the sounds and i popped up and he said yeah you're right folks this one's got a low b <laughs> And recorders are pitched. Yeah, I like the, the joke in there about how they're pitched. Um, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And then there's the sopranino, which is an octave. Or a fifth higher than the soprano. Now, I told you I won that uh, baritone at the Walnut Valley Festival. It was the first instrument I won. And I didn't quite know how to play it with other people. I knew how it played by itself. But then this is another one I won at that festival, the Ginger. This is a smaller fret length compared to the other ones. This, the, these both come from McSpadden. But this one is pitched because it's a smaller body and it's voiced so it would play good in F or in G. And when it first came to me, it was in GDG tuning. And I struggled playing with other people the same way I struggled with the baritone. And what I, that's what led me to creating instrumental arrangements where people could play different tunings together and play beautiful music. And that's what morphed into becoming the Dulcimer Orchestra Library. And uh, let me go grab that for a minute. If I can give you that link. There we have uh, over 30 titles in this at uh, Almont Music, which is my website. Um, but that's information about that. Um, I've conducted the Colorado Dulcimer Orchestra and the Berkeley Dulcimer Orchestra, which is currently on hiatus. But the reason I want to mention the Berkeley Dulcimer uh, Gathering, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks, is registration closes tomorrow. There's still some seats available. In fact, all the classes are going. They all have students in them, but there is room for you. And uh, if you have some conflicts, call, talk to Deborah Hamoris. 
if you are if, if there's a particular thing you're interested in. But I want to call attention to something uh, that's happening on Sunday. And that is the first ever, we haven't done this before. And let's share the Berkeley Dulcimer gathering. Yep. So if I click here to the schedule, you can see here's the schedule. On Sunday, there's a special thing happening called an arranger roundtable. We are gathering some people who arrange multi-part instrument, multi-part arrangements for um, multiple instruments, often played by dulcimers, uh, both mountain and hammer dulcimers. And this is a conversation that gathers. Ashley Ernst from Dulcimer Players News is going to host that. But there hasn't been one of these before. And this is going to be 12.45 to 2 p.m. Pacific time. If you are, if you have registered for the festival or you purchase concert tickets, you have, you, you gain access to that Arrangers Roundtable. It takes place on Zoom. So um, Arrangers Roundtable, Sunday, 12.45, 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, Sunday, 5, 5, uh, 5.15. And um, that's that's taking place there. <laughs> you're afraid you're going to get lost in the shuffle? Um, take the cards you get at the beginning and don't don't uh, turn any in. Maybe that's the, the secret for that. What we're going to do is, let, is uh, people are going to be sharing. Let's see. We're going to. I don't want to do that. I want to, here's what I got to do. Yep. Is we're going to have different people talk about what they do as they're arranging. Um, what is their approach? And Tol Glazner will be there. Kirk and Judy House from the First National Dulcimer Orchestra will be there. Patty Emelot from Southern California, who arranges a lot of Celtic music, sometimes for two hammer dulcimers that are very rich and exciting because she and Brenda, uh, Hunter both play marvelous arrangements together, and I'll be one of the people there. Um, so we'll talk about what are our strategies for arranging and how we do that. It's exciting to me that there are so many more people arranging multi-part arrangements. Um, the, the First National Dulcimer Orchestra has been able to find arrangements to play from a bunch of people, and they do that every Tuesday night. So that's one of those things to pay attention to. Um, They've been doing it for over a year. And I'm going to put, you can find on Facebook. Um, and so that's an exciting thing that's happened in, uh, that's one of the things that happened in the pandemic. The Berkeley, the Berkeley Dolls are gathering in its concerts is going to feature performance, past performances, archive performances, of the Berkeley Dulcimer Orchestra from when we could play in person. Okay, Doug, you're saying there's only one that has a spe part specifically written for baritone. Okay, well, there's more coming. And I know that, uh, that Deborah Hamoris is writing more, and I understand that, yes, you told me you're playing in the playing an ensemble with them, which is very exciting. So there's more coming. You get to be part of the development of that. But what I wanted to do, my goal in this, this uh, focus today is to compare the instrumental ranges so we can have a better understanding of where our voice fits in ensembles. And maybe that can open up some possibilities. It can answer some questions. It can excite curiosity. And as always, if you have further questions, please contact me. And uh, here, you can do it by leaving a message here. You can write to me, steve at allmountmusic.com. And I'll do my best to come up with responses for your questions. Um, at Dulcimer Crossing, I just want to show you, let's see. Nope, 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 nope. The uh, Quarantine Dulcimer Festival website or uh, registrations open this weekend. I'm going to log out so that you can see this. Uh, we have been, I've been doing some some updating of the Dulcimer Crossing homepage. So now 
we have a little bit different menu at the top. We have our history, we have our offerings. This all looks very familiar, the same as it's been. But if you look at our offerings, it's where you can find our membership, the a la carte courses, sample lessons. You can click, we've got a whole course of sample lessons from all the different skill levels on all the instruments we teach. So if you're just trying to see if this is something you wanna do, you can take a look there. You have access to see who our teachers are, our blog, and with all of our posts, you can sign up for our newsletter. If you um, go to the member's site and you're not logged in yet, it's gonna ask you to log in. If you aren't a member, then you become a member, and that's how you get your, your uh, access. And I got to re... That's got something old cached. That's not displaying correctly. Um, but the uh, forum is showing up on this page, and our upcoming events are showing up here. Actually, one of the things we're doing is we're inviting people, members, to come and tell us a story about how you got started with your dulcimer. How did you get started? We're, we're fascinated by that. And if we were at a festival, we would all be having that conversation around lunch. So that's what we're inviting you to do is use our festival tent forum as a way of talking with your neighbors. So it's time for me to head out, but thank you again for being here today. I believe, let me go look at the calendar just to be sure. Is it next week? Aha! In two weeks, Aaron May is going to be joining me, and we're going to talk about some improvisational soloing, but next week, it'll be me again. So I'm going to say goodbye now. This will be archived on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, as well as in the live event section of DulcimerCrossing.com. Bye! <laughs>